Hey, this is Grayson. It is the Fixer Punk podcast, fixerpunk.com. I wanted to record this as a video because even though these do go onto the YouTube channel, the YouTube algorithm actually deranks them um, when they're imported from my podcast platform. I don't know why, but it does. Um, and I've noticed that almost universally with these episodes. So I'm just going to record it because it needs to get out there. I actually even covered this topic on the TikTok, uh, which is Fixer Punk as well. And it is about Patrice Khan Coolers, the co-founder of Black Lives Matter and the controversy surrounding some real estate acquisitions, most notably a house worth $1.4 million in the Los Angeles area. Um, starting with that, I actually I have an inactive real estate license in California. I'm in the LA area, Orange County specifically, and $1.4 million isn't like super rich. It's like Basically, it's like your successful local accountant or software engineer uh, type rich in this part of the country. Um, but that aside, what I want to get a bit more into is based on my background as a political nonprofit board member, my background in the field, and my training um, in political science from USC, there is a bigger issue that this is pointing to. A uh, bigger issue, of course, Black Lives Matter corporate has a lot of problems, which I wanted to talk about, but I didn't want to uh, get into it for a while, for a bit, a bit because it, it's kind of difficult to criticize um, the Black Lives Matter organization without sounding like you're against the movement, which I'm not very much for it. Um, I'm basically a full-fledged leftist, um, but... There are problems with the management structure and systems within Black Lives Matter corporate that need to be addressed, and there are different ways to address that. Um, but in terms of this money, I do not believe, based on my professional experience in the political field, that this money was the result of misappropriation or fraud. I have not seen any evidence that this, is the, that this was the result of fraud. Um, there are, again, there are issues, some issues in terms of the way that um, activism was practiced, um, but I do not believe this came from the donations or that this was some sort of fraudulent misappropriation. It is most likely from um, television, movie revenue, perhaps some fees received for public speaking, um, but largely likely from the media company deals, just like any other like filmmaker, television host, um, those types of things. So it's legit money that's being used for this most likely. Um, and that's something that, that, that it's important, but a lot of people are saying, well, even if it is not donor money, then how is she owning these houses when she is claiming to be a socialist Marxist, um, using those types of labels. And I think it's very, very important to understand, and this is something that has pained me ever since I started, I became a political science major because I went into college, I actually started out as a business major. But when I got into the political field, I was always hearing, well, no, but you're never going to make money in that. And I think a lot of that, you're never going to make money in that is actually sort of a precondition kind of attitude in the field. Because you can make really good money in it um, if you go and work for the corporate side, if you go and work for the right. Nobody on the right criticizes people for making a ton of money. Donald Trump made a ton of money off of people through his campaign with actual fraud, um, as we're coming to find out with some of the payment processing, recurring donation stuff. Nobody really gets on them for that. But on the left, as soon as you start to make a little bit of money, if you're advocating for the people, which that's what I want to do. The reason why this podcast is called the Fixer Punk Podcast is because I was working on the conservative side um, and I didn't really want to – I didn't want to do that anymore. I didn't want to advocate for stuff that helps um, rich people and people with, with pr oppressive attitudes. So I want to become a Fixer Punk 
somebody who works for the people rather than somebody who works for the big titans of industry and the people already in power. But when you get into that, there's sort of a, a kayfabe to it of like a storyline that you that you follow. And this storyline is kind of like obvious is kind of the, this thinking of having like a vow of poverty or that uh, or that you're never or that you're not making money. You don't have any status symbols or symbols of success that you're still just that same person, which it's good to have humility. It's good to have understanding. It's excellent. You have to have that. But I think there needs to be a better narrative around people that are leaders in activism should be compensated well like leaders in business. This is even true with people in government. You'll have agencies with thousands of people working in them and people are pissed off that somebody's making $300,000 a year running that when you could have a company make with 200, 300 employees and be making a whole lot more money doing something a lot less important. And the work activists are doing, work political leaders are doing is important. And important work deserves good compensation. Elite level training deserves good compensation. And there are people who are really talented, really smart people in that want to go into activism, that want to work in activism, want to work in policy. And there's sort of this effect of, well, no, you can't make good money. You can't make good enough money to pay for your student loans even in the field because there's this mindset of no, you have to make sure everybody is kept down, kept um, kept kind of poor, which that mindset overall, setting aside Patrice Coolers, that mindset overall, I think that's that's kind of toxic. You kind of have to change the narrative around that and make it so, well, people should be compensated fairly. But then in line with that, there has to be very strong accountability. If you're going to be a professional organization, you're going to break the kayfabe of being just a little tiny organization that hasn't yet matured, if you're going to break that kayfabe, you have to be able to show the level of professionalism that comes with that that status. And the Black Lives Matter corporate structure just seemed very confusing. Experts in the nonprofit field are confused by it. One thing to clarify is that they are probably initially using something called fiscal sponsorship, which the best overview of this practice can actually be found in the Public Skate Park Development Guide of all things. Um, so if you look up Public Skate Park Guide Fiscal Sponsorship on Google, you can find that. Basically, it's where one 501c3 nonprofit runs the operations of another 501c3 nonprofit as a subsidiary to make sure that the, that the donations are tax deductible without having to wait for IRS approval, which can take a long time. Um, but the corporate structure is confusing. Some of the way that they manage themselves, some of the structuring was just needlessly confusing. And it's just practices that can be tweaked to make things better so you don't have massive controversies like people going around saying hey look our family was featured in their advertising they've raised money they used my family's tragedies some of these families that have had to deal with tragic losses of family members to police violence unfortunately they have not been getting the help or they state that they have not been getting the help that they expected from black lives matter and casework in general, like helping individual people, policy people tend to be really bad at that. People like like just adopting a mindset of at least being as good as like a typical business at customer service would literally help with 90% of those problems. But people with activism aren't terribly good at that stuff. I've come to learn at like the customer service, the retail aspects of it. But if you you can kind of work on those things so that you can live further and further above reproach in a position of power transitioning to power is a very very important and key thing when you're establishing an institution because black lives matter is now an institution it's not just a little group it's a big nationwide institution and you have to run things well, but still in a humble, kind, compassionate, caring way, and in line with your values and principles, allowing self-organization, allowing things like self-governance, 
allowing organiza- allowing groups affiliated with you to run things like mutual aid. And there are restrictions, unfortunately, with 501c3 organizations that you need to work through and find alternate structures to deal with. They set up an alternate structure, a PAC, Political Action Committee for f- Political Fundraising Purposes, which that's a good step. But there are other things that can be done, financial transparency, uh, making messaging consistency. Patrice Coolers is really smart. She's clearly one of the best in the field right now. Um, obviously, it feels kind of weird me being little old Grayson Peltier criticizing one of the best people in, in, in the political field right now. But I always think that there are, there are different types of input that can be given, so I give them. I'm not ashamed to do that. But um, when you're dealing with this type of institution, there are, there are always ways to improve. She's spoken of ways of improving the management structure of Black Lives Matter, which I really, really appreciate. Obviously done a great job of organizing um, and getting mass media attention and mobilization, which that's the first job that you do in this business is getting mass media attention and mobilization. That's also how you make your money is because then you can go and do TV deals. And media deals in the conservative world where I was, radio deals were a big thing. I knew of people from reading industry publications or small-time conservative radio personalities pulling 250 k a year, whereas a leader in a more left or kind of charitable type organization pulling 90 k a year is even a good accomplishment. Um, of course, there's different ways of reasons why there's more money flowing to the right as opposed to the left. But there is also a mindset and a paradigm shift of running things properly and getting things done so that you can have that money without reproach and talking about it and being clear about it and not just pretending to be. And I didn't like this even when the right did it, sort of like pretending to be poor, pretending to be something you're not. You can put on a good show. You go out there, you you put on a good show, for the for your for your demonstrations for your speeches you do that stuff you do that stuff with excellence you relate to everybody around you you be kind to everyone around you you work with communities deeply but you acknowledge who you are and what you're doing you acknowledge yeah i'm a professional with a master's degree with a professor title and i am doing this work this work is helping your community this work is worth x number of dollars I work with media, I work with TV networks, I work with film studios, and I produce this content, and it's worth this money. We're doing this, this, and that to make sure this is taken care of. And of course, the whole thing with not being not directly supporting black communities, that's tough, which that which it should be done, but in terms of the way of thinking of nonprofits and political nonprofits. The way generally it's done is that the money has to be sent bent in an exceedingly specific way. You can't just spend it on anything. Once it's in 501c3, particularly 501c3 fiscal sponsorship where you have another board above you that's other than your little organization's board, it has to be spent in specific ways and those ways have to deal with activism. So that's why Black Lives Matter is carrying a lot of money and they're holding an endowment right now. Um, supposedly, according to their reports, um, you can't just go and say, "Okay, we're going to go and help black people who are homeless." We can't. They can't just go and say, "Okay, we're going to help black businesses out." It has to be at least somehow linked to the organization's mission, which probably has something to do with criminal justice reform, research into that, research into activism, legal assistance, things of that sort. So it has to be spent in the specific way that is in line with the mission of the organization. And also, another important thing is you cannot necessarily just hand out money directly to people. Like the families that are involved, I would pay them just as endorsers. If this was my organization, I ain't a lawyer. I don't know any of this stuff. But what I'd be asking my lawyer, if I was Miss Coolers or leadership at BLM, is can we pay them as as like personality rights for personality rights or for endorsement? so that the families can get paid somehow. But you, but even giving grants, you have to be clear that there's no private benefit. It has to be administered almost like a government aid program 
with specific qualifying requirements, vetting third-party tests to make sure that financial tests and analyses to make sure that you still qualify because if not, that's an IRS issue. So that's why it's kind of hard to spend the money outside of very, very she she kind of things that sound that sound kind of technocratic. That's one of the big flaws of 501c3s is oftentimes you can't get your hands dirty and do like the kind of work that makes sense to an average person. It has to be all this technocratic stuff because IRS likes you doing technocratic stuff that makes sense based on an organizational mission and based on a structure and based on a system that other nonprofits are are following. And that's that's a challenge that you have to that you have to work through. There, I I'm confident there are ways to deal with that and ways to be very transparent in communication, and basically having it be like you're you're a trusted brand and not just this name. You you go from a name to being an institution, and then bringing in like the one of the biggest fails I think is the local chapter leaders. Local chapter leaders, those people should be on the board of directors. You can put them on the board. They should be front and center in this you train them you bring in the right people to support them and you and you make this more participatory but all these things like uh, even back in the conservative movement there were all kinds of controversies around how tea party groups were spending money stuff like that political groups keep getting it wrong 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 every every single time both sides of the aisle um so there's not terribly not terrible amount of blame but there's some blame in that in that regard. And at the end of the day, you want to be in a place where you can even go out and say, look, this is an accomplishment. You want to be able to go and you want to be able to hoist that money you've earned, that house that you've purchased as a trophy. You don't want to have to hide in fear and shame because you can say, look, we won together. We won. We helped these people. We did our jobs well. I got paid from this. I did a good job on TV. I put good content out there that's valuable to help educate people of our movement. And I earned this. Look at this and be proud because you also got this. It's got to go both ways. Help yourself, help others. And that's kind of my philosophy. That's where I want to be in the political field and the whole thing of taking donations and it's a little tough because you're taking taking money from people who prob- oftentimes don't really have the money and a lot of these things are very technical and complicated but you have to find a way to communicate it and there's also something to be said about kind of keeping separate business models and keeping everything clearly delineated you have one little you have one business model or one system um, of local groups that are doing local mutual aid operations that are that are doing things that are specific to their community that's donated in one way um, that they're working specifically in their communities that's all self governed but then you have the master organization which is doing research on criminal justice reform, and this is specifically said okay you're giving money here this is going for criminal justice reform research advocacy and um and and legal uh, legal cases say, or this is going to developing um, developing get out the vote programs. You have an organization that's for get out the vote programs for supporting new candidates, for supporting congressional candidates, for supporting state and local candidates. If you give here, and you want to delineate that, and you want to make sure people know, okay, yes, this is what I'm giving to. Yes, I want to give to research into criminal justice reform and developing solutions for that. I want to give to programs for um, for researching alternatives to police, to conventional policing. I want to put my support behind that. You don't want to give a bad impression of like, okay, I'm giving money here, so this goes to help this family that needs to cover their funeral costs, when in fact it's going to a a think tank. You don't want that. You want to make sure that that's all clear and that you can do this all with good conscience. And lots, oftentimes it's just that it's not intentional. It's just that people get themselves in over their head because 
they like the stoke of the of the crisis moment and just trying to work through that, trying to work through that, go pr- go out, do the protests, do the rallies, do the press appearances, and you're not thinking about the nuts and bolts of this stuff and making sure everybody's happy. You're going out, you're flying the flag, you're giving the big vision, asking for the donations, and then you don't know where to where to take them and people and you and people get confused by what you're saying and where the money's going so there's some room for improvement there of course um but i just want to get this out there to explain kind of from my perspective as somebody who worked in politics has education in politics um was on the right which on the right I it's all the all the conservatives that are coming out Fox News coming out cr- criticizing Patrice Con coolers when in fact they don't criticize Donald Trump and his auto collect donation s- scheme that has resulted in numerous credit card company disputes they don't go and criticize how much money their personalities are making they don't criticize the rumors about when Rush Limbaugh was alive like how much money he was spending on private jets Stuff like that when claiming that he's going that he's going to go out and, he, and his his ideas are being lapped up by the people in Appalachia who are also not doing so well and that and pretending to be an advocate for the people I guess uh, within that demographic but still making tons and tons of money so there's double standard there too but of course it's politics they're going to mudsling. You just have to keep yourself strong enough for that and you have to be upfront about it and also have an attitude toward like in the conservative movement, obviously success is celebrated, but you want to find a way to within the the leftist context also celebrate success, celebrate it like, okay, it's our teammate who got the victory, who secured the bag here. They should be rewarded. Bring out the champagne. And that's where you want to leave it with everybody happy and everything running with a good structure to get you through the future of your activism. All right. Um, Follow me on Twitter at Grayson Nation, G-R-E-Y-S-O-N-N-A-T-I-O-N. Follow me on TikTok at FixerPunk, um, fixerpunk fixerpunk.com. If you want to email me, that's Grayson, G-R-E-Y-S-O-N, at Grayson Peltier, P-E-L-T-I-E-R.com. This has been the Fixer Punk Podcast. I hope you'll join me next time.